Um, hello to, uh, to everyone that's joined us so far. Um, this is the, uh, the Dragon Argent Tax um, webinar. Thank you for uh, uh, registering and jumping on this afternoon. Um, we're just going to wait for a few moments uh, and give other people a chance to, um, to join. Um, so just bear with us. Um, maybe whilst we're waiting, I'll just introduce ourselves and Dragon Argent. So for anybody that hasn't been on one of our webinars before or doesn't know an awful lot about Dragon Argent yet, um, we are a boutique professional services consultancy. Um, so we combine accountancy, tax, legal and advisory support. And we provide that predominantly to tech enabled startups and scale ups in and around London. Um, so that's the reason that we are doing the webinar today. Um, the types of uh, challenges that founders typically face as they're growing their business, uh, specifically relating to tax are things that we advise clients on day in, day out. Um, so I'm here with uh, two of my colleagues, Craig Williams, who is our CFO and head of our accountancy practice, and Misha Patel, who is the head of our tax practice. Um, and what we're going to do um, when we get things underway, uh, we're basically going to use a scenario. I'm going to imagine that I'm a founder. I'm about to start out on my startup journey, and I'm going to ask um, Craig and Misha as we go through what are the tax considerations that I should be mindful of so that I can really utilize some of the incentives that we have in the UK to help make my business robust, uh, make it as efficient as possible and to scale it as, as quickly as possible as well. Um, so we'll, we'll just wait another a few, few seconds or so while, while people join. Um, if there are any questions that anybody has as we go through the webinar, please feel free to add them to the, um, the chat. They'll pop up, we'll be happy to answer them. We obviously want this to be as informative um, and interactive as possible. Um, so, We'll, we, we'll get things out of the way because we've got a, a good number of people uh, who've joined us now. So as, as, I, as I said for anyone that's just joined, I'm going to imagine that I'm a founder. I'm about to, to embark on my startup journey. And Misha and Craig are just going to give me some advice on the things that I should bear in mind to, to, to utilise the tax incentives that we've got in place um, in the UK. Tax can be daunting, but it can also be somewhat of a superpower for a founder if you can grasp um, how to utilise uh, the advantages that we've got. It can really fuel the growth of your business. Um, so to kick things off, one of the key uh, tax benefits that we've got are, uh, are SEIS and EIS, which is a way to raise um, uh, investment from angel investors. Um, Misha, because that is so um, foundational for this, this webinar, maybe you can just start off by telling us a little bit about that in some, in some more detail. Yeah, sure. So um, the SEIS and EIS scheme is a UK government scheme introduced to help companies raise investment by offering a number of tax relief to individual investors. Okay, and, and um, th there is a way um, that founders can take advantage of that scheme themselves, which I think is, is not what necessarily well understood, um, but can be have really, really significant implications. So what if I'm a founder, I'm thinking about trying to take advantage of that, what things should I, should I do? Um, so there's a range of things that you need to do. Um, firstly, um, as a founder, um, if structured correctly, um, founders can um, actually themselves um, claim SOS um, and EIS on their shares. Um, so the initial subscriber shares um, on incorporation can sometimes qualify for SEIS. Um, and sometimes um, directors that have been with the company for a long time can sometimes get um, EIS on them shares as well. Okay, so I so if I'm a founder, I need to think about that before I incorporate my business because they need to be subscriber shares. They need to be the first shares that are issued. Yeah. Um, and then are there any other limitations that I need to be aware of in terms of how, you know, how long I need to have the shares for or the, the amount of shares that I can hold? Um, no, so they, there is one that you have to hold less than 30% um, in order to claim um, EIS, but that is isn't typically um, the test for SEIS. You can hold more than 30% for SEIS. Okay, um, so the, the, the reason that's so important and the reason that we started off with that is we, we're going to discuss why SEIS and EIS is, is really crucial for angel investors later. But if I'm a founder and I'm able to, to, to go through that process and issue myself with SEIS shares, it means that if I'm successful, I build my company up and I have an exit event in the future, I can actually pay no tax on the disposal of those shares. Yeah, absolutely. So on the disposal of the SIS and land shares, I'd be able to pay no tax. So if you compare that with capital gains tax, which I think is 20%, yep. that's a pretty significant difference. Yeah, absolutely. So that's the reason we started off on that. I think if anybody on this webinar is pre-incorporation, 
um, it would be sensible to have a conversation with us to talk about how you can utilize that it's because it has such a big impact um, okay so so just going back on to sort of a more regular timeline um, I'm, I'm pre-incorporation but I've started to spend some of my own money getting my business set up um, so I, I, might, I bought a laptop I've subscribed to a few different um, uh, pieces of software um, to start planning so I'm starting to spend a bit of money is there anything that I should be aware of in, in that respect yeah, so at the outset of the business, it can be quite difficult for you to differentiate yourself from the company, I guess, especially pre-investment. Um, it's likely to be your own money that is going into business to get them off the ground, as you suggested. Um, but what I would suggest is that you do maintain very good records of those business transactions um, and sort of build up uh, a list of the expenditure that you've had in relation to that. So there's various reasons why you might go ahead and do this. Um, Firstly, it will create what's called a director's loan account, which is essentially money owed by the business back to you. And why that might be useful is it gives you a, a sort of tax-free pot to draw down um, outside the scope of income tax and national insurance to be able to remunerate yourself properly when the business has generated cash to be able to do so. Um, the other advantage you can have is that if you do put it through the business and the business is VAT registered, then you can reclaim all the VAT that you've incurred, which could be around maybe 20% of your expenditure. So again, that will allow you to reinvest that further into the company. Um, some of the reasons why it might be useful are to ensure that the business is recording all of its expenditure properly to use against future income and reduce corporation tax profits, which again would save you around 19, 20%. Um, corporation tax rates are rising now. So if you spend 10,000 of your own money, then you can reduce your profits by that amount. It could be a saving of a couple of thousand. Um, and finally, something else that we'll come on to as this webinar develops is R&D taxes, um, which is tax incentivizations for research and development. And again, this is a very generous scheme. And if you're spending your own money, you won't be able to use that in the R&D scheme unless it's properly recorded um, and noted as business expenditure and brought into the company accounts properly. Okay, excellent. So the key there is just to be organised, you know, from, from the moment you start spending money on setting up your new, new venture, record what you're doing, and then you'll be able to tap into all those different advantages um, later on. Absolutely. It's probably as simple as just making notes of the transactions. Ideally, a segregated bank account is a very easy way to do that. And um, maintaining invoices and receipts for any business expenditure, um, as HMRC can occasionally look into startup businesses quite in depth okay um perfect so so then i I'm, i get myself incorporated but I'm a, I'm a technology enabled business so i know i've got to spend a lot of money developing my technology is capital intensive um so I've, i'm gonna have to go out and raise investment um because of the nature of my business it's it's likely that i'll be doing either a pre-seed or a seed round so pre-seed i might go out and speak to friends and family that's the usual process to, to go through but then I might start reaching out to angel investors, and that's typically where seed investment would come from in, into, a, into a startup. We talked about um, SEIS a little bit already, and we know because of the tax breaks that SEIS and EIS offers investors, it's really crucial that I'm eligible for that. So what steps, Misha, should I take to give investors comfort that I'll be, be able to, to issue them with qualifying shares? Um, yeah, so we would definitely recommend um, a company submitting an advance assurance advanced talk assurance to HMRC and this basically gives a company a provisional indication that they qualify under the scheme um, in general and also that gives the investor that comfort um, that their investment um, that they will achieve that tax relief um, on their investment. And just just give us a sense of how significant the tax relief is for investors why is it so important? Um, so for SEIS um, investors can claim up to a 50% income tax relief on their personal tax return at the end of the tax year. Um, and if they invest under EIS, they can get 30% income tax relief. Um, so the limits are quite high. And also for the company in general, um, for a company that's been trading for less than two years, they can raise up to 150,000. Um, and you know, from April 2023, that limit is set to increase to 250,000. Um, and for companies that are just less than seven years, um, they can raise investment up to 5 million and um, 12 million over the company's lifetime. Okay, so there's significant amounts of money and with the tax relief that investors are able to, mm -hmm. to achieve, that's why it's so important to be SEIS, SEIS eligible. Um, 
we, we won't go into a lot of detail on this now, but there are ways that um, founders can invalidate their SEIS and EIS status. We've actually got a blog that's written about that. And there are some do's and don'ts that you should definitely be mindful of, especially if you use the self-service type models that are out there. Um, so we'll maybe share that with attendees uh, after the webinar, just so there's things that they are, they're conscious of. Um, I think we might have had uh, a question just while we've been talking. Let me just see if I can check that. Oh, yes, yeah, someone's asked if we'll get the recording. Yes, we are recording this session. So that will be sent out um, uh, later on today or first thing tomorrow. Everyone will get that. Um, uh, we don't, somebody's asked about whether we, we help set up companies in the UAE. We don't help set companies up in the UAE, but we do help companies looking to move to the UK um, who might be established elsewhere. Um, and there's another question about the recording. So yes, the recording will definitely be sent out later on today or tomorrow. Um, okay, so I've, I've now successfully raised my angel investment. That's helping me fuel the growth of my business. At this stage, I'm predominantly um, putting that into developing my, my proposition, my, my technology. Um, I'm going to develop quite an innovative piece of technology. Um, so what, what should I be mindful of in that instance and how can tax relief help me reinvest money into my growth? The primary relief in this would be research and development tax credit. Um, so just to summarise what that is, that's a UK government incentivisation um, to encourage investment into UK companies and spend to be born in the UK in relation to innovative um, new technology, new sciences, new propositions, as you suggest. Um, so any company that falls under UK corporation tax is eligible to this to an extent. Um, if you're an SME, the scheme is more generous than if you're a large company. Um, but essentially, any company can benefit just by creating an advance in science and technology, um, which can essentially exist, exist in any sector. Um, we most commonly see it probably in, in software companies, but that's not to say you can be in a food industry or, or any other sector that could be producing something new and innovative, or even just improving uh, services or processes that are already out there. Um, it works a lot of the time for new companies, such as the proposition you're suggesting here, you're likely to be loss making initially. And even though it's called a tax credit and you won't be paying corporation taxes. Um, that's a slight misnomer because loss making companies actually can benefit from this in a very generous way. And they actually receive a cash rebate to the tune of around one third of their expenditure in qualifying eligible expenditure back as cash in the bank at the end of their financial year, which obviously can then be reinvested into further growth in your company and reclaim further down the line. So qualifying expenditure um, is anything that directly contributes to the new science or technology. So a good example of that would be your own salary costs or the salary costs of other people you hire. Um, if they're working on developing the technology for 80% of their time, for example, you can claim 80% of their salaries, their national insurance costs, their pensions costs, as eligible expenditure to then reclaim back through the research and development tax credit scheme. Um, you can also include subcontract costs, um, any software costs you've incurred, any materials, um, any development and testing prototypes, that sort of thing. Basically, anything that takes you from a period of uncertainty through to a final product is something that you can accumulate and claim in the R&D scheme. And when, and when do people? When do you find people typically put those claims in? Is there a, is there a certain process or time when that happens? Yeah, so the claim has to be in line with your financial year. So I guess one negative of the R and D scheme is it it's backwards looking. Um, you can only claim it for expenditure that you've already incurred and paid for. Um, so for example, if your your financial year ended in June, then you'd have to pass June to then file your corporation tax return and make use of the cash back in hand. Um, you can often think about playing around with when your year end is. Um, you can shorten your year end as much as you want. Um, so that's something that can be done if you're looking to liquidate the R&D a little more quickly. Okay. And, and really a question for, for both Craig and Misha, because um, I know that they've both dealt with R&D um, inquiries from, from clients and prospective clients at Dragon Argent. 
Um, are there typical mistakes that you see people make? They think they'll be eligible for R&D, but it's not a qualifying expenditure. Can you think of examples where that, that's come up? Um, so generally, um, obviously, HMRC's legislation, um, under that legislation, you can only claim for a certain type of costs. Um, there are some capital expenditure that people think that they can claim. However, um, you have to bear in mind that they have to be profit and loss expenses in order to claim a cash rebate. Okay. And I think things may be just like if you are signing up to an existing platform or you're developing a platform using existing technology um, or a marketplace or a website, but it's it's really using known and, and existing tech. Yeah. Even though someone might be spending a lot of money on that, that's not necessarily going to mean it's a qualifying expenditure. Is that uh, right? Yeah, you're correct. So using existing technology out there um, doesn't actually qualify. You really do have to push the boundaries in terms of science and technology in order to claim R&D. Okay. What I would add to that as well is it's often quite difficult to differentiate if you are fully innovative, if you are a fan from technology and the founder might have one opinion that HMRC might not have. So you do often find yourself in a bit of a grey area here. Um, until the last couple of years, the advice has always been, if you're in that grey area, push it as far as you can, HRC are very lenient, HRC are almost advocating that you did that. Um, although since COVID, we have seen them becoming a lot stricter in terms of passing through claims without real scrutiny. Um, so some of the pitfalls we see now is just where clients have sort of tried to self-style their R&D and perhaps haven't worded things in a report in, in the right way to really short, show off to HRC if they understand the legislation. Um, so I would say now more than ever with R&D, it's definitely best to just get proper professional advice on this because there's ways of tailoring your claim that sort of really add strength to it. Okay. So, so again, you know, as a, if in this scenario I'm the founder, I'm always going to be conscious of cash and expenditure. But there are certain examples where it makes sense to get good advice and pay for that advice because if it's something like submitting a narrative to HMRC for your R&D claim, there is a skill to doing that and it might be the difference between getting agreed and not agreed by HMRC. Um, and, then, and it also just so, yeah, let's imagine that I've utilised my full SEIS allowance. I've raised £150,000, but then I've gone on to use, say, 100000 of that to develop my innovative new technology. It might be that I can claim up to 33% of that, so maybe £33,000 back from HMRC. And if I'm not making profit, that is literally going to be a cash payment back into my bank account. So again, it's just starting to paint the picture of how significant some of these um, tax incentives are and the impact that they can have on, on businesses scaling. Um, so I've used my R&D tax relief. That's gotten me to revenue generation. I've been able to now go out as a founder and, and hire some people and get some support. I've got two or three employees who I think are really key and they're going to make the difference between me scaling and becoming commercially successful, or potentially not. Um, but I'm still, I'm still conscious of cash. I don't think I can spend lots of money on salaries, bonuses, commission, benefits to keep people incentivized and, and tie them into the business. So what other schemes are available to me to use to, to, to achieve that? Um, so there's the EMI scheme, the Enterprise Management Incentive Scheme, and what that allows you to do is give options to employees upon in the future at a discounted price um, agreed with HMRC right now. So the scheme is very flexible in terms on, of um, retaining, motivating and incentivizing employees, and um, there's a lot of flexibility drafting up the whole scheme, so you could give options to employees um, either over a number of years or tied to performance conditions or even on exit only. And giving out these options, what it really does is help um, employees' interests align with that of the shareholders of the company um, if they have more of a tangible interest in the company. So typically what we see founders doing is um, giving out um, shares to employees either by way of a gift or at under market value, and that leaves employees with a um, high income tax bill. Um, what EMI does is on the grant of these options, there's no income tax. And when the employee eventually does exercise their rights to these shares, there's no income tax there either. There's only a capital gains tax when they, the employee eventually sells the shares. So there's um, a massive benefit there, to obviously, for um, employers to tap into. Um, and we would definitely recommend it um, um, as a scheme for um, 
um, incentivizing and uh, motivating your employees. Okay. Um, and again, as a founder, I might I might hear uh, the idea of issuing shares to employees. On the one hand, I, I want to incentivize and tie employees in, but on the other hand, I want to retain control of my business. Mm -hmm. So if I'm issuing EMI options to people, am I losing control of my business at all, or can I dictate what control people have if I'm issuing them with those? Um, so when you're issuing options, that doesn't dilute any of the shareholders. What it, when it dilutes it is when the employee eventually exercises their rights to the shares. And that could be on exit. So if you plan that the employee only exercises on exit, no shareholders are diluted until that point. Okay, perfect. Um, so I've tied my employees in. Um, I'm now hopefully you know, revenue generating, possibly even profit making, but really I'm, I'm, into, I'm through the startup phase of my business and I'm, I'm very much into the scale up phase. Um, so whilst we're talking about a lot of the exciting things to do with tax, there are also just some standard tax obligations that I've got in order to be compliant. So we don't need to go into a huge amount of detail, but what are the tax implications of running a business? What are my obligations as a family? Um, I would say the three main ones that come to mind are corporation tax, which you have to calculate and report on an annual basis. Um, that's even the case if you're on a loss making startup and you know because you have no profits, you're not going to have corporation tax, you still have to report the value of your losses to HMRC. Um, that's something that might come quite a long way down the line because it has to be done within one year of your first financial year. So. At some point within your first couple of years, you're going to have to do that, um, and then on an annual basis. Um, with regards to your staff, you're going to have to operate a payroll scheme. Um, payroll, obviously, your staff will have salaries, but you can't pay them the gross salary. You need to deduct the right amount of tax. Um, income tax is national insurance, student loans. Um, declare that to HMRC and pay it over to HMRC on their behalf. Um, so you need to operate a payroll scheme, which is ordinarily a monthly obligation. Um, and finally, VAT. And VAT can be a useful tool as, as well as an obligation. So um, the threshold at which you have to register for VAT is 85,000 worth of ratable sales over the course of a year, um, at which point you will be duty bound to, to file a VAT return and pay over the VAT that you've charged to your customers um, and recover the VAT that you've incurred on your expenses. Um, that's when you're obligated to, to register and file, but it could actually be the case that even if you're not yet selling a product, it might be beneficial for you to register. Um, this is particularly the case for B2B businesses often. Um, and we won't necessarily delve into the reasons for that today, but that's often a good tool for B2B businesses um, to be able to recover the, any VAT on expenditure that they might be incurring even before they're, they're making any sales. Okay. Um, and just, I mean, this might be a tricky question, but are there just any sensible ways to treat these three areas efficiently? I mean, there's anything you find yourself advising clients on when they're thinking about their VAT, their corporation tax? Um, it's difficult. Obviously, with, with corporation tax, you've got the R&D is, is built into that. Um, you want to ensure that you're making the most of your expenditure. One example would be for capital expenditures such as uh, computers, you can now claim a super deduction on those where you actually get 1.3 times the value of your spend back as opposed to just the value. Um, payroll is a, a little bit more difficult to play around with, but um, I guess it kind of goes back to Misha's talk about EMI. If you want to reduce your payroll taxes as a startup, that's all well and good. You might have to incentivize your staff in another way. That's where EMI schemes could come in. Um, so a lot of the time, you can reduce your tax burdens. You've just got to think of other ways of how to position it. Okay. And I guess if if I'm, you know, as a non-accountant, I'm a founder of my business, um, when things are in the early stages and are perhaps quite straightforward, I might be able to do some of this myself. But as my business becomes more complex, that's when it makes sense for people to go out and get advice to make sure that they are you know, not overpaying their VAT or their corporation tax and treating that as efficiently as possible. Um, so I've now got a successful business. There, you know, we are we're profit making, um, money's coming into the business. I now want to start taking some rewards for all the hard work that I've put in and getting this established and set up. 
Um, what are the considerations in terms of extracting profit in the most sensible way? So I guess the most basic method is salary, um, and that would be something that you can arrange for yourself. Um, the problem with salary is it's not very tax efficient, so you'd be paying income taxes and an employers' national insurance on salaries. Um, that could mean that the cost of what you're actually getting in your bank, there's an extra 50% or more of that just going to the tax man. So that's never ideal, although it's a fairly common setup. Um, if you are profit making, as you suggested, and you have excess cash as a distributable reserve, you can think about dividends. And often there's something called a director's salary, which is around £9,000. And that's the upper limit at which you don't need to pay any income tax or national insurance. So often as a director, you might take that director's salary and any excess in dividends because the dividend rates start from 7.5% as opposed to income tax rates of 20%. Um, and equally dividends aren't subject to employers' national insurance. So that would be another way of, of considering how to extract. Um, another option, maybe you've already built and sold a company previously, maybe you're, you're cash rich and you don't actually need to extract, but what you could do is, is put some of your gains into a, a pension scheme. Um, that's a tax-free benefit for you, so you don't pay any tax on that. Um, and it's also tax deductible for the company. Um, so that's the most tax efficient scheme if, if the family is in a position where they don't need to extract cash from the business. Um, employers' pensions are, are definitely the way to go. Okay, um, we're just going to pause for a second because we've had a few questions come through. So we'll thank you for those. And if anyone has joined um, the webinar recently and you have a question, please feel free to put it into the chat. Um, Ed has asked if we have various commercial packages for startups whose requirements are largely unknown at this stage. Is there a minimum size startup you will work with? Um, the simple answer to that question, Ed, is that there, there is no minimum size startup that we work with. Um, we work with founders from literally before their business incorporated. Um, and our objective as a business is to try to grow with our clients. Um, so we actively want to engage with people at very early stages. Um, in terms of packages, it completely depends on, on needs and, and size of business, complexity of business, what it is that you're doing. So that's more bespoke. But if you would like to talk to us more about that, you can book a discovery call. Um, Fatima has asked, if you are a small business, when should you pay tax, national insurance? Is it compulsory to pay towards a pension? Um, and lastly, how to keep records in a simple way that is easy and not complicated? Um, I might just answer that last one. There's loads of accounting software packages out there now that, that you can utilize. A lot of them are very reasonably priced. Um, we typically use zero. A lot of our clients use zero. I think from the top of my head, it's about £25 a month, and it will help you be organised in terms of your record keeping. Um, but in terms of uh, the second question, maybe I'll, I'll ask this of you, Craig. Um, is it compulsory to, to pay towards a pension? Um, you can opt out, and often directors, founders do opt out of a pension. Um, if you're employing other people, you can't make them opt out. Um, and at that point, the the company will be obligated to pay 3% of their salary into that pension scheme, um, which ultimately is, is not a great amount. Um, it, it doesn't move the needle too much on, on making a hire. Um, the other question in there, when should you pay tax and national insurance? So um, tax and national insurance of, of payroll staff comes under what's called pay as you earn. Um, which means when that employee is remunerated on a monthly basis, you record um, the amount that they've been paid to HMRC, and you've got to the 22nd of the next month of, with which to pay those taxes and national insurance costs. Um, just to, to cover off potentially something else that passed from event, corporation taxes have to be paid nine months after the financial year end in which you made those profits. And VAT, if you've got any VAT liability, that's one month and seven days after the period end. Um, and normally VAT is done on a quarterly basis. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Craig. Hope that answers your questions, Fatima. And if, again, if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to, to chuck them into the chat. We will do our best to ask them. Um, coming back to my journey as a founder, um, I'm quite a long way through um, um, my journey now. I've built my uh, business successfully. I'm taking profits out in a tax efficient way. And in fact, I've been so successful that I'm now thinking about an exit. 
Um, I, I believe I've got a valuable enough thing that somebody would want to come and acquire it. So I'm going to realize all of the hard work that I put in. Um, what are the tax considerations that I should be thinking of um, at exit? I, I might just start off on this one and circle back to what we talked about right at the beginning, which is that if we were really clever um, and before we incorporated our business, we were able to um, issue uh, founders with SEIS um, qualifying shares. We would have zero tax at disposal, which is a massive advantage of doing that. Um, it's a bit complicated uh, in terms of how you do that. So anyone that's thinking of that, again, I'd encourage you to get in touch with us. But let's assume I, I wasn't able to take advantage of that. Um, what what tax um, consideration should I be aware of? So at this point, because you're selling an asset rather than sort of receiving income services, it falls under capital taxes rather than income taxes. Um, this is a good thing because capital taxes um, range between 10% and 20%, whereas income tax can be 20% up to 45%. So at the point of sale, you're getting better bang for your buck in terms of the amount of cash generated that actually goes into your back pocket. And it'd be worth pointing out at this stage, even if you weren't necessarily making a sale, but your business had run its course, um, you had a different job offer, or simply you wanted to retire and, and, and the business, you don't actually have to sell the business. Um, you can liquidate the assets in the business at that point in time, the cash, the assets, the, and debt, um, and that too would be caught under capital rather than income taxes at much lower rates. Um, typically for a founder, you would, um, apply something called entrepreneur's relief. Um, entrepreneur's relief is now also known as business asset disposal relief, but commonly known as entrepreneur's relief. And, and what that does is it reduces the taxes from 20% to 10%. Um, generally, founders of businesses will be eligible for this, um, so long as their business has existed for over two years, um, then you'll be able to obtain 10% at the point of sale of your company on on any gains. Okay, is there is there a limit? To, is there a limit to that? There's a limit to how much. Okay, that so, entrepreneurs relief is probably one of the most generous schemes the UK government has, and especially since COVID, we have seen tightening um, of generosities of some things, particularly R and D, as I touched on already. Um, and there is now a lifetime limit on entrepreneurs relief of one million. Okay. Um, that used to be ten million. Uh, it became one million a couple of years ago. Um, there's often rumors that that the entrepreneurs' relief might cease to exist at some point in the future. Um, that's something we just don't know. Um, but for the time being, um, you'd be able to sell the first million valuation of the company tax at only ten percent, um, which simply you will never be able to obtain a million pounds in, in income in the UK at such low rates. Okay, and so it's, there's kind of almost like a um... A scale, you know, if you've managed to utilize SEIS, you would pay zero tax. If you utilize the business asset disposal relief or entrepreneurs relief, it's ten percent. Everything else is a capital gain, it's twenty percent. Yeah. Um, that that kind of naturally takes me to the end of my very brief journey as a founder, going from very quickly starting my business up and then telling it I've been very successful in the thirty minutes or so that we've been on this webinar. Um, but are there any other kind of changes that are coming into effect? That have been announced um, that, that people on the webinar should be aware of? Um, yeah, so there are a number of changes coming into effect from April 2023. Um, one of them being the corporation tax main rate. Um, so currently it's at 19%, but that's set to increase to 25%. Um, however, companies making profits under 50,000 um, will still pay the current rate of 19%. Um, another um, main, uh, main change that's coming um, into effect is for R&D. Um, so generally, um, as Craig spoke about earlier, um, any qualifying costs under R&D at the moment, um, for every pound spent, you can claim back up to 33p. However, that's set to decrease to 18p. Um, and for profit making companies, um, currently you can claim back 25p and that's set to decrease to 21p. Um, it's still such a generous scheme. Um, and especially for larger companies, um, we've seen a generous increase in the um, claim rate, um, especially with the increase in corporation tax um, going up. So it's a great scheme. Um, and I would definitely urge all like um, companies to make, um, you know, make availability of that R&D. Um, another um, change that's coming into effect is subcontractors costs. 
So the UK government want to refocus on all subcontracting costs to the UK to boost the UK economy. Um, so any um, companies that are currently outsourcing beyond the UK um, can no longer claim um, subcontracting costs um, under R&D. So companies will have to, you know, weigh up the um, costs on should they hire subcontractors in the UK and claim R&D, or should they outsource um, outside the UK um, because it's more cost-effective. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's that that final point is really important because I know for a lot of our clients who've used developers in places like India, historically they've been able to reclaim some of those costs in their R&D. They're not going to be able to do that anymore, and therefore you have a commercial decision to make about using developer teams in the UK, maybe slightly more expensive, but are eligible for R&D relief versus teams outside the UK. Um, okay, so just, we, we, we've gone through obviously an awful lot of material there very quickly. Um, just as a very brief recap, um, some of the most important things for founders to consider would be SEIS and EIS, and the importance of that both for founders themselves, but then also for uh, investors in the future. Um, how you should treat money that you spend before you incorporate your business and the tax implications of that, um, the positive tax implications of that later on. Um, we talked about R&D tax relief quite a lot and what a fantastic uh, tool that is for you to be able to use. We touched on EMI options and how you could use that to retain, motivate, incentivize your, your staff. Um, we looked at how you then extract profits um, efficiently from your business. And finally, we just talked about um, the tax implications of actually exiting your business. So we've gone through all that very quickly. Um, if there are any more questions that anyone would like to ask, please feel free to put them into the chat now as we just wrap up. Um, to answer the, probably the most asked one, we will be sharing the recording um, over email. So if you've signed up and we have your email uh, details, then we'll obviously be sharing the recording with you. And we'll also put some links into some articles that we've written um, which are uh, relevant to what we've been talking about today, especially the do's and don'ts for SEIS and EIS. That's that's really, really useful. Um, but it doesn't look like we're necessarily getting any more questions. So I think on that note, I'll just thank Misha and Craig um, for all of their uh, sharing all of their thoughts with us and for everybody joining the webinar today. So thank you very much.